We're continuing uh, the series that we started last week on the Beatitudes. And uh, let's read again from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Today we're looking at the second of those Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But um, before we turn to that, a recap on some of the things that Nigel spoke about last week. Uh, and first of all, this word blessed. It's a very difficult word to translate. Some of the new versions of the uh, uh, Bible translated as happy. But, but that's not really capturing what it's about. Happiness today, we think of as a feeling. It, it, it's a sort of jolliness inside, and you're happy when everything's going well. But the word blessed is more than just feeling happy. It's about being in a good place. It's about everything being well with you. It is well with my soul. Um, for the... Jews who were listening to Jesus in the first century, the idea of blessed meant approved by God, somebody that God is looking after. Now, as far as they were concerned, to be blessed meant to have lots of money, to be comfortable, to be respected. The Pharisees and the scribes, the rulers of the uh, people, they were blessed of God. Obviously they were. They wouldn't have all this money if they didn't. And so, for them, this is a complete surprise. It's a complete shock because Jesus turns it up and upside down. Blessed, not are the wealthy and the comfortably off, but blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted. It just didn't make sense. But Jesus is saying the people who are approved by God are not those who are comfortably off. They're the people who are struggling. The people who are up against it, they're blessed by God. Nigel also reminded us that the Beatitudes are about being, not about doing. We have a tendency uh, to think that the Beatitudes are rules for Christian living. These are the rules, and if you obey these rules, you will be a citizen of God's kingdom. But that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus is saying, if you are a citizen of God's kingdom, this is what you will look like. Do you see the difference? It's not what you do in order to become a citizen, but if you are a citizen, this is what characterizes you. And of course, there was only one person who ever fully met the description in the Beatitudes, and that's our Lord Jesus himself. And so, again, we tend to sort of separate these things out. You are blessed because you're poor in spirit. You're blessed because you're mourning. I'm blessed because I'm persecuted. But that's not what Jesus said. All of these Beatitudes are describing the same person, the poor in spirit, the mourn, the those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they are all the same person. And this is what we are to be like if we're going to be like Christ. And Nigel reminded us last week that God's purpose in bringing us to himself is that we should be like Christ. 
He reminded us of Romans 8, 29. Those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And also in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So the Beatitudes, this description here, is describing what we are eventually going to be like. We are all works in progress. Uh, some of us are further along the line of being a completed masterpiece than others. Some of us are just in the first stages of being rough cut out. But God is working in us to shape us to be like Christ. So, turning to our beatitude for the day. Blessed are those who mourn. A definition, first of all, what is it to mourn? To mourn, according to the dictionary, is to feel or express great sadness. Mourning is not about our intellect. Mourning is about our heart. It's about our emotion. It's about the way we feel. One of the dangers, certainly for me and I think for a lot of people, is we intellectualize our Christian faith. It's all about knowing the words, being able to quote the passage, being able to refer back to the Bible. But this is about feeling and about the heart. Also note that there is a promise connected with it. Those who mourn will be comforted. There's no sort of question about this. It's not, they might be comforted, or perhaps they'll be comforted. Or if all goes well, they'll be comforted. They will be comforted. And this is not our usual sort of thing. Well, there, there, time is a great healer. You'll get over it. Things could be worse. And all the other things that we say when we are supposed to be comforting people. We're very like Job's comforters, aren't we? We always get the wrong end of the stick. That's not what Jesus says. He says, those who mourn will be comforted. And one of the names of the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the one who is called alongside to comfort. And Jesus says, if you are mourning, the Holy Spirit will come and will comfort it's the arm round the shoulder, not the false um, advice. So why do we mourn? The most obvious cause, of course, is bereavement. We've all heard um, at funerals this verse being read, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. There are people who seem to give the impression that if you're a Christian, you shouldn't really be mourning. But grief is a natural process. Grief is a God-given process. It is right that it is proper to grieve. For, for that reason, we're hoping at the end of November to hold a bereavement service, a service which is open for anybody who is bereaved to come along and just Rest in God's presence and find comfort in knowing that God cares. For the Christian who is, bere who is grieving for another Christian, there is special comfort. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.14, We do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Notice he doesn't say we don't grieve. He says we don't grieve like the rest of mankind, because we have a hope. The person who has died has gone to be with the Lord. They're better off than they were. They're better off than we are. It doesn't mean we don't grieve. I mean, after all, if somebody goes abroad to live, you miss them. You feel the loss. If somebody dies who knows the Lord, you still feel the loss. 
But we know there is hope for those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Because Jesus rose, they will rise. But I don't think primarily Jesus was talking about bereavement in this passage. It, it, it doesn't fit in with the whole, the whole tenor of the passage. And if the Beatitudes are telling us what Jesus was like, then the question is, what was it that made Jesus mourn? You all know the famous story of Lazarus. It's, it's one of the most poignant stories in the whole of the Bible. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, and he became ill. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, sent for Jesus. And I love this. The message they sent was, Lord, the one you love is sick. Doesn't that say something very special about the relationship between Lazarus and Jesus? But Jesus doesn't do anything. He doesn't hurry off to heal him. He waits. And then in due course he goes, and by the time he gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Mary says, Lord, if only you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. It's difficult. There's no explanation. And it says in verse 33 of John 11, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you led him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus was deeply moved. He was troubled. He cried. Jesus was mourning. Why? He knows that in the next few moments he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead so why is he so upset Jesus feels the pain and the hurt of those around him and he mourns with them and that's still true today all of the pain and the hurt in the world our Lord feels it and he mourns with us. But there are other reasons why Jesus mourned. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus is looking at Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Can you just feel that the heartache, the heartbreak as Jesus looks at Jerusalem? And again, in Luke chapter 19, the, what we call the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, the crowds are in front of Jesus, waving the palm branches, and they're all singing, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, riding along with this crowd, among all this excitement, looks at Jerusalem. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus mourns for the unbelief of the nation. He mourns out of empathy for others. He mourns when he sees the unbelief of the nation. He is deeply moved and troubled in his spirit. So if we're to be Christ-like, 
then we must have those same reasons for mourning. We need to have empathy for others. And Romans chapter 12 verse 14 tells us that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and we should mourn with those who mourn. I mean, do we really feel the pain and the hurt that other people are feeling? I mean, it was obvious when Jessica was telling us about that young man that it was hurting. She was feeling it. Do we? Or do we just look at the world around us and we can see what's happening, but it doesn't affect us because we're all walled off and we are secure and we are in our nice, happy cocoon. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 to 4 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Isn't that a beautiful description of our God? He's the almighty God. He's the creator. He's holy. But he's the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We find our comfort in God. We are therefore able to bring comfort to others. And it's a virtuous circle. It's not that I am always bringing comfort to you. Sometimes you will be bringing comfort to me because you've had special comfort from God that applies to me now. And part of the promise that the mourners will be comforted is found in the body of Christ. It's found in us as God's people. We need to be comforting one another. We need to be bringing people the comfort that God has given us. But that means we need to be sensitive to the needs of other people. We need to be aware of what's going on in other people's lives. And when we're aware and we feel their pain, then we can share their pain and we can bring them comfort. So, we mourn because of bereavement. We mourn from empathy with others. We mourn because of the state of the world. Or do we? In 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5, the Apostle Paul says, There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Does that sound familiar? 21st century Britain? It's just there, isn't it? Mind you, the last days have been around since Jesus ascended, and it's always been like this. We have particular versions of it in our days, but the world has always been at enmity with God. The world has always been opposed to God. And the problem is, for the last few years in this country, well, the last century in this country, we have tried to live as if we could make the world a godly place. We can't. The world is never going to be a godly place. But we are called to oppose the world. We are called to stand on God's behalf. But our problem is that we look at the world and we can recite all that's wrong with it. And it's at an intellectual level. We can say, this isn't according to God's will. This isn't the way God likes things to be. But... We're nice and safe in here. This is a great place. It's warm, it's friendly, it's cozy. The worship's wonderful. 
And it was wonderful this morning, wasn't it? And God's presence was really here. But do we mourn? Does our heart break because of the way the world is? Does our heart break because there are so many people who don't know God? There are so many people who don't know the Lord Jesus? Or are we content just to stay within our cocoon? What comfort can we find for our mourning for the world? Well, Revelation 5.5, 5, the elder says to John, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. Do you believe that? It's not that one day Jesus is going to triumph. One day he's going to be king. He has triumphed. He has overcome. On the cross he said, it is finished. The victory is done. And he rose from the dead to prove it. And he lives today and he is on the throne today. And no matter how bad the world is, God's power is greater than the world. And one day, things are going to be very different. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. One day, things are going to be transformed. Until that day, we are called to work towards the coming of God's kingdom. Not to sit in here and be content, but to get out there and to spread God's kingdom here and now, waiting for that day when it comes in all its glory. There is, however, one thing that we mourn for that the Lord Jesus Christ never had to mourn for. And we are called to mourn for our own shortcomings. James says in James 4, verses 8 to 9, Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. It's worth remembering that James is writing to Christians. It's very easy for us to sort of look at the world outside and say it's a terrible place. When James is talking about the double-minded and the sinners, he's talking to Christians. And all of us, if we are honest, know that we fall short of God's standards. Now, we can do that at an intellectual level. We can say, we know 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And we can say, of course we fall into sin. But we can accept that as kind of the way things are, and what can you do about it? James says, mourn and wail. Do you really mourn for the fact that your Christian life is not the way you would like it to be? Do you mourn for the fact that you fall short of what God expects of you? It's only those who mourn who will be comforted. James goes on. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. The point of the mourning is not that we beat ourselves up and say, this is terrible, I can't do anything about it, I'm an awful Christian, don't have anything to do with me, I'm going off to hide in a corner somewhere. It is to say, Lord, I do mourn for my sin, and I come to you, and I repent, 
I change my mind about this sin. I have realized that this sin is something which hurts you, which is deeply damaging to our relationship. And I want you to take it and to remove it. And James says, if you do that, the Lord will lift you up. Not he might. Not he'll give you a set of instructions as to what to do to uh, overcome things. He doesn't set a penance that we have to follow in order to get forgiveness. He just needs us to come and repent and say, I'm sorry, Lord. Help me. And Isaiah 61 verse 3 puts it like this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, the passage says, and it's talking of our Lord Jesus Christ, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Isn't that beautiful? What God wants to give you is a crown of beauty, the oil of joy, and a garment of praise. May each one of us know what it is to come to him for that forgiveness and to experience that joy that only he can give. Mike opened the service this morning by referring to Psalm 23. And there's that well-known verse in it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Those who mourn will be comforted because the Lord Jesus himself will bring that comfort and walk beside us.